What um, what might visit that then? Would that be a hummingbird flower? Too, no. too, too small. So, so many of them are each. What in yellow? An insect. But maybe an insect. Like a light. Probably an insect. Something, is, there's a nice little landing platform there, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Hoverfly. And whites and yellows often are bee, hmm. are bee attractants. Another curious thing about this, if we were to really look carefully, is it doesn't have nectar in it. This one produces as a reward just pollen. That means it probably wouldn't be of interest to most butterflies mm. who like nectar, but bees love pollen. They collect it and they feed it to their larvae, mm. among other things. that it's very important as humans to understand our community and the only way for us to understand our environment is if we also understand the effect that we have as humans in that environment. So our students do a two-week program in which they explore the rainforest and they take home a curriculum for their own classrooms that has integration of culture, anthropology and science. You cannot really understand biology unless people are part of the biological piece. Really a lot of the purpose of this course is to think about the ways in particular that science and social studies are necessarily existing in the same space. And so when we think about any of the real issues that we need to be teaching about, thinking about climate change and environmental issues, thinking about issues of social justice. Being on the top of the mountain we don't have much water. So that's one of the biggest, biggest issues here. And uh, plus the tourism picked up so fast. Actually, I was against the road. We have many issues that we need to work on first to think about road. We need to work on garbage. We need to work on sewage. We need to work on children. Uh, places, uh, areas for children to play. For for everybody, not only for children, for teenagers, for elder people, there's nothing okay. Because everything became a restaurant, a hotel, yeah, or a tour. As teachers, we serve as guides, we provide experiences. It's very much a hands-on uh, job doing course where they create their own questions and we test those questions in small groups and individually and with a curriculum that gives them a pretty deep look at what Costa Rica and Monteverde life has been in the past 50 years, how we have affected the environment and how the conservation efforts are being supported here and how we can participate in them. We are at the farm. Right now we are in a section that says queso slash cheese. But I'm not sure. I know it's not a dairy farm, so it would be for these here. What are we but trying to find out? We're trying to find out about what heats up the dung, let's say, um, so that it can be reused in a fruitful way because there's a, a sort of barn over there that apparently somehow heats up or makes the uh, waste compose faster than it would naturally. That smell that we were having over there, yeah. down there, yeah. folk smell, yeah. was nothing. Yeah. If we do not burn it, we're creating a greenhouse gas that's worse than carbon dioxide. If we burn it, we turn it into smaller things. And you use the heat for cooking or whatever else? In here, it's intended for boiling milk ah. to produce cheese from the oh, That's why it says queso, right? Uh -huh. Once you 
find something that calls your mind, see what kind of questions you can ask about it that are testable questions. What's of interest to us that we could quantifiably measure? So we want something we can count. Something we can count. <laughs> what if we did something like with moss? Because Amy has her compass. <laughs> yeah, I have to use that. She has to use her compass, so what if we did something like, does the moss always grow on the north side of trees? We did a, we did a study of um, the Underground Railroad, Ooh. and one of the things that kept coming up was that how do you show, your, how could you figure out the direction that you're going in without technology? And the kids were really, they were really perplexed by that. And I know that one method that I've heard or I've read in like literature and things uh -huh. is using the moss on the north side of I've heard that tree. Oh, interesting. But I don't, I never knew if it was true. Like, that would I didn't be know an amazing to... tie-in. Yes. Okay. I kind of feel like it's a, it's a tale, not necessarily a practicality, so I'd right, be right, really right. curious. Well, especially here because we're in the equator, so will it actually work? This flat stuff grows on every side, which I think is like, like, a, ooh, look at that yeah, you funky you have to, ooh. So when we would measure, it would be Mackenzie's shoulder height for all the trees. So we would kind of see, um, we would take the circumference of the tree, and we found that a lot of the of the thinner all trees had it had um, moss all around it. And then over at the top, it started to it started thin to out, thin out, to but it would, and it would be mostly on the north side. But we also figured that um, it seemed a little bit subjective, so we wanted to come up with instead look at the north side, the south side, the west side, yeah. the east side, yeah. and do a little checkbox just if it was present if or it if was it there. wasn't, right, that and that way it would be a little bit rigorous data. Yeah. Yes, precisely. You could do this easier in a place like Central Park or, or in like Hill Park, Park. Wait, where it's more the obvious. Yeah. Where the sun, where sun patterns and there, there's not as many things well, getting in the way of it. would it. also be awesome to grow moss in your classroom and then give it different oh, conditions like yeah. moisture, dry, UV, no UV.